Thank you so much. So, Telmo Pivani, welcome again to Puerto Ideas. Thank you. So, today we are going to talk about imperfection. Yesterday you talked about serendipity, it was a great talk, but today we are going to discuss imperfection. So, because it's the title of your book in English and also Imperfección in Spanish, and because it's very counterintuitive, right, in these days where everyone seeks perfection, why did you were interested in the first place to reflect and research about imperfection? Thanks. Good morning to everyone. Thanks, Pablo. For, it's, it's, it's a privilege to dialogue with you, and thanks for the invitation. I know that imperfection could seem something like a strange issue, but I think it's, it's interesting for many reasons. The, the first one is that imperfection is a good way to explain people in a popular way how evolution really works, because we have many Uh, misunderstandings of evolution. We think that natural selection is something like a, a process that produces perfect structures, uh, like an engineering. As we have the idea that evolution is an engineering process. I prefer to think that evolution is something like a bricolage, something like an artisanal way to use what you have at your disposal to change function in a creative way, because this is how it works. And the second reason is exactly what you said, so that, that we have this intuitive but not correct idea that nature is something already ordered, uh, harmonious, in balance, balanced, um, rather to see the reality that nature has change, nature has contradictions, nature has uh, a, a continuous flux, f f fluidity of change. So imperfection is a good way to see exactly like a photo Uh, what, hap what is happening in, in evolution. It, it was Charles Darwin originally that said in a, in a private letter to, to a friend in the United States, a botanic, botanic um, friend, he said, uh, he, he was a young uh, student of Darwin, and he asked Darwin, let me, give me suggestion about how to see evolution in real time in nature. And a wonderful suggestion by Darwin was, please see imperfections because when you see imperfections you see story in progress when you see perfection story is already done so you don't see evolution evolution is in the imperfection in vestigial traits in the compromises in the structures because when you see imperfections story is happens and you can see evolution uh, during the process and tell me during your research for the book Uh, you, uh, you write and you highlight so many examples about imperfection, error, contradictions that are very, very key to evolution. What main examples can you share with us about how imperfection works uh, in evolution? Yeah, I, I, in the book I, I wrote many examples referring to human, uh, human body, for example. Human body has nature said in a, in a wonderful paper, he's a compendium, is an encyclopedia of imperfections. Our bipedalism is an imperfection, is a, is a, um, a trade-off between a quadruple structure and this upright position, that it, it, it's a very recent adaptation in the, in the human evolution, just related to the genus Homo, and with many compromises, okay? So our head is so fragile, Uh, so the fact that we have the most precious organs completely exposed without any protection, it doesn't make sense in evolution, or the many problems that we have in the back, so we are a biomechanical trade-off uh, in, in, in this process. The human delivery is another uh, is example of an incredibly inefficient process in evolution due to a series of compromises between upright position, the growth of the Of the, of the head and the brain, and so the delivery is so imperfect and so, um, so, so painful, and it doesn't make sense. No other animal has a delivery so imperfect like us, and, and so on. And human brain is a wonderful example of imperfection and redundancy, or the DNA, another wonderful example. The DNA is full of sequences without any sense, completely useless and so costly, because you have to maintain the 95% of DNA is not made by genes, codifying for proteins, is something else, is what we call junk DNA or redundant DNA. So this is another kind of imperfection. 
But what is amazing for me is that in evolution, exactly the most uh, redundant structures like brain, brains, DNAs, uh, ecological ecosystems are all redundant structures. They are also the most creative structures in nature. So we think, we don't know exactly why, but we think that imperfection is something at the root of the creativity in evolution. For example, we recently discovered in Padua, but in, in other labs that in some cases in evolution, new genes, so novelties, exactly came from what we call junk DNA. So reusing old structures, old sequences in the so-called junk DNA and combining them in new ways and producing new genes, for example, for, for the development of human brain. So we use junk DNA for new things. This is why I love the metaphor of bricolage, because it's exactly an example of bricolage. I use already existing structures for different functions. And that's wonderful because it's exactly one of the secrets of the creativity. And even the, so, the, the, this delivery is so painful for humans is related to the fact that we have infants with a prolonged period of, um, of learning, of imitation, of playing. Uh, so we have this immature birth of our, of our um, child and then this cost has a wonderful advantage in other terms, so the evolution of culture and the evolution of human creativity. So, again, we have a cost in perfection, but we have also a wonderful advantage of this cost. Evolution is a, is a continuous trade-off. It's not something like an engineering starting from zero and planning a, 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 a body or a species. So, tell me, you say, as you have explained here, imperfection is the source of all things and creativity and contradiction should be embraced and even error. Uh, but you were saying before that uh, the other paradigm of way of seeing nature as something uh, related to perfection, evolution seen as, you know, the depuration of this idea of perfection has consequences. Which consequences are the worst ones that you can uh, think about in this kind of thinking? Yeah, very good question. We, you, maybe you have uh, attended the, the wonderful inaugural uh, conference by, by, by Mirta, if I remember well the name. It was exactly related... Sandra Diaz. Sandra yes. Diaz, exactly. Sandra, sorry, Sandra Mirta. It was related to our uh, metaphors related to nature. So the Eden or something as a resource that we can exploit or uh, the... Anyway, something related... Or the Jardin, so the fact that we have a continuous coevolution. One reason is this one. So. Uh, our ideas of nature has, has a, a, a perfection process is related to environmentalism and our idea of the relationship between um, human species and, and the environment. Because we have to, to think that even in the relationship between us and nature there are imperfections, a continuous trade-off. So a pristine nature never existed. So we are the son of a continuous process of co-evolution with nature. And we are nature. So we are part of a system. It's, uh, philosophically speaking, it's, it's, it's wrong to continue to think as nature with a capital N as something uh, external to us. Pandemic was a, very, a tragic uh, epiphany of this, of this illusion that we have to be separated, to become to became separated by, by biodiversity. And biodiversity uh, kill us because we, to, to do things to... To, to viruses. Another point is that nat if you, I have to say in a quite provocative way, nature could be also um, a very right-wing uh, uh, idea in the sense that you can think that some behavior are natural. In many cases, many conservative people use nature and biology as an ideological argument in order to uh, promote what are just cultural. Uh, ideas and were just social structure, nothing to do with nature. So, and this I think is related to our um, mistake to think nature in a hierarchical way. Let me say in other words, if I think that in nature we can find standards of perfection, okay, humans, animals, so like in the past, like before Darwin, okay, and it's every species has a standard of perfection. What is the immediate consequence? Is that the, the diversity of the single individual is something that has a distance more or less 
to the perfection. So the immediate consequence is a hierarchical approach to nature and even to human life. Hierarchical in the sense that always there will be someone more close to perfection and other uh, far from perfection. So perfection is a, is a dangerous uh, idea. It's a very suggestive, so we love perfection, but could be a conformistic idea. Uh, for example, in the web today, you see, we study this in Padua, in, we study how in the web, and this is a really interesting paradox, because the web is one of the most technological environment that we have, but in the web now we are repeating very old patterns of behavior. Tribalism, so tri tribes, so close communities, and in each community you have a standard of perfection that marks the conformisms of the group against other that follow other uh, standard of perfection. So perfection could be a very dangerous, for me, it could be a dangerous way to think. So imperfection is also a provocative way to try to criticize this idea of nature, this idealized and ideological idea of nature. And, and that goes to what is natural, right? Because, you know, as you say, some would say, okay, this is how nature works. This is the natural state of things. Any other thing would be considered unnatural, and in that sense, you have to be, you know, uh, away from that. So... I, I don't know in, 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 in Chile, but in Italy now, we have uh, an incredibly crazy debate about what is a natural family. Uh, Okay, natural family is a family based on something natural, but it, it, it's interesting because I study nature. In, if you want to, to find natural families in nature, you have to compare our uh, history with, for example, our uh, most closest relatives, like so chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and so on. And in each of these species, uh, bonobos, in each of these species, you find completely different structures of families, of social groups, of uh, social cares and so on, and, and parental cares and so on. So which one do we prefer has natural model? It's a completely crazy question. There's no natural models of human behavior. There are diversity, there are similarities and differences, and we are a unique species, as any species is unique. So it's, most, it's much more... Um, scientifically correct to think that our models of families are cultural models, not natural against unnatural models of family. In Italy we have a discussion about what are, what are the natural sexual behaviors, okay? And people say, no, but we can find homosexuality in many uh, natural species. We can find now homosexuality is diffused in more than 200 species of mammals. Who cares? So uh, we don't need uh, to find natural argument for promoting freedom or to be against freedom of humans. That's the point. And also, tell me, you, you say very strongly that evolution is an open field, so it's not a destiny, it's not fate. We're all the time, you know, it's a continued process, a fluid process. How do you see it playing out in this time, in this moment of history, when the seeking for perfection is, is so present, right? Not only in the, in the political domain, as you were uh, giving these this great examples, but also in the way of living, people trying to be, have the perfect body, the perfect lifestyle, uh, social media promoting that, and um, you know, Elon Musk and all these billionaires trying to go to the moon and do unachievable things. So how is this dialogue? playing out, how we are evolving, evolu the evolution playing out in this moment of history. Yeah, that's a great point because now we have, we, I, I can answer in two ways. One is a popular, um, our daily life. We have many uh, ways through which we can um, remove human imperfections. And this is at, at some degree absolutely right, okay, medicine, uh, social behaviors, so our scientific progress can remove uh, the reasons of pain, suffering, diseases. So it's absolutely important to fight against these kinds of imperfections. Because in, in my book, imperfection is, has nothing to do with an ethical value. 
Imperfection could be very um, painful, could be a source of, of problems for us because we feel imperfect, we feel not in our place, so it's not nothing that we, ha we, we have to idealize. So we can fight. It, it, it's ethical um, uh, right to fight against imperfections. But as always in human behavior, this could become also a different kind of imperfection. For example, aesthetic fight against uh, against imperfections that again this is not a case of of, uh, of a fight against diseases or therapeutical interventions but aesthetic interventions and i'm not referring to just as, in a superficial way of thinking to aesthetic but think about the potentiality that we have today we study in padua this of the use of gene editing for human embryos okay we will have to decide in some years at which degree we decide to, to use gene editing for um, eliminating, for example, human diseases, okay? And we can do it for uh, anti-tonkaria, for mask, mask um, dystrophias, and so on. And so, in this case, we will have therapeutic interventions. But where is the boundary between therapeutic interventions and aesthetic interventions that could be very ethically controversial. So we will have to discuss about this and it's related to imperfection. For example, in Europe, but also in the United States, there are communities of people um, um, with, with handicaps, for example, that say, please don't think to us as something different to your idea, to your model of perfections. Think about me as un an example of unique, different with respect to you. So help me but I have to decide when and why you can use your tools for me. So that's, that's absolutely a point. So how we will fight again, um, against imperfection using uh, the most advanced uh, technological uh, tools. So we will have to discuss about our models of imperfection. One of my most, um, most important worries is that when you fight against imperfection, you have to be aware that you have not to uh, um, low down and, and diminish the diversity of individuals. So diversity of, and uniqueness of each individual is the fuel of any evolution, of any change, but also it's the fuel of democracy and freedom. So the diversity of each individual is the real value that I think you have to defend and, and, and to tolerate imperfection of the individuals. That's the point. So, and if you look in many cases, for example, using gene editing or biotechnologies in plants, animals, quite always they reduce diversity they reduce individual diversity. So I think that they are wonderful, powerful tools that I want to use them to, to against, against diseases, but we have to be careful when they reduce diversity. Let me just give another example that we are discussing in Europe. In the United States, in Brazil, and in Africa, for the first time, we used in the field another uh, biotechnology that is called gene drive, and is a possibility to extinguish in a, an intentional way, a, a biological population, for example, of mosquitoes carrying malaria or mosquitoes carrying uh, Zika and other diseases. Now we can do it. We can intentionally extinguish a population in nature through this biotechnology in which a male, when, co when, when breed with a female, the female became sterile. So you can extinguish a population. So this is, could be very good because malaria uh, has quite uh, half a million of victims every year. But we have to also to be aware and careful because in this case, we diminish the diversity in an ecosystem and we don't know exactly the side effects of these interventions. This is another example of, of, of fight against imperfections. And that's a great example, the mosquito carrying the malaria, because it's like playing God, right? Like gene editing as playing God, because you can say, okay, I get rid of the mosquito and the malaria, but also this, uh, we, you really don't know which other species are affected by the lack of mosquito, or which other species will, you know, uh, get out of control without it. So that's, you know, you move one thing and then you know, don't know the result, uh, what's going to happen, what's the outcome in the rest of the ecosystem. Exactly. Fortunately, in Florida, the most recent data uh, say that it doesn't work. 
it doesn't work but because nature has always much more subtle and much more creative than us because they apply a gene drive. The mosquitoes, the male of, in, in mosquitoes are just 50 meters of range so they sterilize just a few, uh, few females and then the wild type of male w are, are stronger and they substituted immediately the gene-drived uh, male. So nature is always stronger than us. And goes ahead in the play. So this goes to one of the, you know, your main focus of interest and research, that is the philosophy of science. So you say, you know, it's very key that scientists uh, have to uh, predict and to see before what are the moral dilemmas that their research is going to bring to the table, right? They have to anticipate that. So it seems to me that, for example, now related to gene editing, but also to artificial intelligence, for example, one of the topics that we are all debating in the world, we didn't anticipate this, right? Because it's like, you know, letters from prominent people saying, of, please stop GTP for six months, which is something, you know, we can't even uh, find a way to uh, develop, you know, vaccines for all the world, even though we know it's, it's really important. So it's very uh, naive to think that, you know, what, who is going to make this decision? And on the other hand, you know, people are saying, okay, this has the potential to really, you know, have a, a, a very, very bad uh, impact on, on, on humanity. So what do you think about, about this? This was a moral dilemma that, you know, was... They were scientists were very negligent about thinking it before, or was it a very you know uh, uh, amazing thing that came to us without uh, without the possibility of anticipating it being real? Yeah, that's an example of serendipity. Right? So you cannot, you, we are not able to anticipate all the the, the advancement of of science. But in the case of ChatGPT, is different because it's an evolution that was predicted of the, about the machine learning. So the possibility to have a massive machine learning and with an incremental um, logic, because now we have in the web a huge amount of information and you can use machine learning, learning from this huge amount of information. So machine learning become powerful and powerful, but we have not also not to overestimate the power of, this, of these tools because they have limits. And what is important for me is how to use them. Uh, because in, in, in my field, in biology, in biotechnologies, or in human evolution even, so with the um, gene sequencing, the comparison that we, uh, we make between genomes uh, in order to reconstruct the pathways of human migration, for example, we really need uh, big data and we really need intelligent, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So we need the new tools in order to um, give order to this great amount of, of data. But what is crucial for me is that at the end, the chief of the operations has to be humans, has to be us, humans. So because we have to use this machine learning as a tool for our understanding, as a tool for exploration. For example, we use ChatGPT in evolution to create different models of alternative evolution. That is very funny because you can find alternative ways of evolution and you can understand a lot of things because, because you can understand a lot of things about the constraints in evolution, the possible uh, and impossible evolutions. If you understand an evolution of an animal that is impossible, this is very interesting because you, 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 you learn something about the constraints of evolution. And so you can use ChatGPT to explore, so in a serendipitous way. But you are the chief of the operation, not ChatGPT. So the illusion is to use ChatGPT as a substitution of human intelligence. This is not the case. Should be, it should be not the case. That's the point. So it's a, it's a moral dilemma. And, but if you, if you dialogue with the the most important expert in, in artificial intelligence, like Francesca Rossi in uh, New York, uh, IBM uh, um, lab, she says exactly this. We are developing uh, an not an alternative intelligence, but a complementary intelligence with respect to the human intelligence. And I hope that this will be. And so do you use ChatGPT? What's your relationship with it? We use, this, we use this for this alternative scenario of evolution or another example, now we are collaborating with the New York Institute of Technology in New York and we are using um, evolutionary metaphors in order to apply them to design. 
to the design of uh, artifacts or buildings because in the design we can use evolutionary models and chat gpt is wonderful because you can you can see alternative way of uh, for building for design of objects and so my colleagues at the institute use my metaphors evolution metaphors and chat gpt to explore different possibilities many cases in many cases are just um, games are just playing but in some cases you can learn something about something unexpected about your your domain so it's a, again a serendipitous and what we call heuristic way to use chat gpt so heuristic means um, using chat gpt are you able to put new questions are you able to understand something new okay so it's a good uh, use otherwise it's a bad use I, I always apply a wonderful ethical principle proposed by Heinz von Furster, one of the fathers of cybernetics in California. And Heinz von Furster, many years ago, said, you have a way to uh, find, to understand if a new technology is good or bad. If the new technology increases your, the number of your possibilities and your choices is good. If the new technology reduces your possibilities and your freedom is a bad technology. I think it's his right. And do you think these claims about uh, ChatGPT or it artificial intelligence being a threat to humanity, they are exaggerating the point? They, they don't get it? Or is it a possibility? It's a possibility. But I have to say, as an evolutionist, that so far it's a theoretical possibility. In order to have a real alternative intelligence, you need time, a lot of time. You need bodies interacting with an environment. So we have cases of these experiments. For example, maybe you know the artificial intelligence applied to what we call mobots. So robots, very, very small. Uh, for example, uh, simulating the behavior of hands or insects. So in this case is what we call a bottom-up logic of robotics. I'm, I'm involved in some, in some groups that use soft robotics, for example. So robotics using soft tissues and soft materials, not the classical anthropoid robots, completely different. So are robots, animal robots simulating other kinds of, of creators. And in this case, the logic is bottom up. So I create uh, an artificial structure with some biological feature at the base, and I wait for, for their evolution. So they interact, they learn to interact in an environment, and slowly they evolve. But it's, we are just at the, at the early, early, early stages of such a process. Nothing to, to do with, with human intelligence, the human brain. Because again, human brain is imperfect, is redundant, is able to reuse continuously all the structures for new functions. No, there's no machine able to do that. So again, imperfection is what is uh, typical of human and, and machines are because they are engineerized by us. We are not, they are not able to do that. So, and I'm happy about that. And what are the moral dilemmas that worry you the most in, in scientific issues? I mean, what are the things that we should be really thinking about from the perspective of philosophy, moral dilemmas, and the advance of science today? Yeah. I think that the, the moral issue that is most worrying for me is, in general philosophical terms, related to this gap. The gap between human imperfection, okay, so the imperfection of human behavior or intelligence, that, okay, it's a great resource, but it's also a limitation. For example, we have a brain that, is, that take, takes decisions always in a situation of compromises. For example, with an internal fight between old structure of the brain, so much more intuitive, emotional, and more rational. It's not a good um, uh, dichotomy. Anyway, just to, 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 to make a, 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 the story short. Uh, and in this case, the final decision is not perfect. It, it's, a, it's a compromise between this internal fight that you have in your brain. So, on one hand, you have this imperfection in human behavior. On the other hand, you have tools that we have today, technological tools in, in, for, interven for intervention on nature, on human nature, that are more, more powerful. So now we have very powerful tools in the hands 
of a very imperfect species. So that's the problem. So we are still the imperfect species coming out of Africa a uh, thousand years ago, but we completely new tools in our hands that we can use it, but we sh should not use it. So that's the general problem that we see. This growing gap between our biological limitation, emotional limitation that we see every day in politics or in war, or, and the, the, the power of the tools that we have in technologies, not just for war, but also in our peace technologies like gene editing, as the examples before. And do you think that with our imperfect brains and all, with all the limitations that you have so well described, but also with our ability to, to change, to evolve, do you think we're really learning now? Because we were talking about this yesterday, talking about the pandemic, right? In, in one moment of time, we all realized in the world that we were very vulnerable, that our relationship with nature was not really working well, that it was something, as David Quammen predicted, that was like a predictable surprise. But, you know, we went back to business as usual, seems to me. Now, you know, we are not worrying about a new pandemic, but it's possible, I mean, I mean, even it's probable, to have another one. So, do we really have the ability to learn from our mistakes? Uh, that's a great question, and I think not exactly, in the sense that I'm... Uh, I'm very afraid about the, uh, the way now we are escaping and, and we are going outside the pandemic because we are removing the most important message of the pandemic. The pandemics are ecological and evolutionary phenomena. So we tend to refer to pandemic as, okay, a medical emergency, has an epidemiological a diffusion of a microbe, of a virus, okay, that's right. We, have, we tend to think about pandemic in terms of biotechnological solutions, so vaccines, and that's okay. But behind all this stuff, there is the ecological issue, the evolutionary issue. The evolutionary issue is very simple, and it's related to imperfection. Microbes, so viruses and bacteria, are very perfect example of evolution. They do just one thing, reproduce themselves, make copy of themselves, nothing else. They are very simple. The coronavirus is, what, what is a coronavirus? It's is a wonderful example of biological perfection. It's a biological machine. Just one line of RNA surrounded by a capsule of proteins. Nothing else. Nothing else and very powerful. It's a very old organism. We know that maybe since the beginning, Three billion years ago, the first organism was were something like a coronavirus. So the herd is dominated by them, not by us. If a, an alien is now studying the earth, and the question is how, which are the dominant organisms on, on this planet? Plants and microbes, not humans, okay, in terms of evolution. So microbes are very powerful. They are perfect. They mutate much uh, rapidly than us, 1,000 times more rapidly than us. So we are very slow because we are giant mammals, pluricellular mammals, so we are slow. They are very rapid. They are much more diverse than us. We are just one species of mammals. In mammals, we have 5,000 species, okay? In microbes and in viruses, we have 5,000 species of coronaviruses just in China, okay? 5,000 species just in China, okay? So a, a, exactly the number of, the, of mammals on Earth. So they are much more diverse than us. So we have to be afraid about this enemy because they are obligate parasite. They use us as vehicles, as means of diffusion. So the pandemic has an evolutionary aspect that we have to learn about it. And the ecological aspect that I think for me is quite tragic because, okay, they are so strong enemies, but now we are doing our best to promote their success. Because pandemics in the last 40 years became exponentially more frequent due to un what we call anthropogenic niches. So deforestation, uh, the illegal trade of animals, of exotic animals, plantation, 
plantations, uh, wet markets, the list is very, is very long. These are all anthropogenic niches that promote the diffusion of microbes, of bacteria, and, and so on. In the case of bacteria, we use antibiotics in a completely rational way, and now we are producing a very predictable evolutionary effect that is the antibiotic resistance of many super bats or super bacteria. So what is a pity for me, a real pity, is that now we are um, uh, uh, following the solution of the pandemics and we are removing the rooted, the most profound reasons of the pandemic. So now the risk of a new pandemic is exactly the same than before the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are not so sapiens as Omo in this case. As we think that we are, right? And as you say, it's also the, the same kind of thinking about climate change. What is it that we understand with one part of our brains that what's going on and then with the other part we have a, a very amazing ability to deny it, right? To be in denial. Yeah, exactly. I think that it's a, it's a, it's a good parallel. Usually not, you, not, not so frequent between pandemic, environmental crisis, and climate change, because they are connected, of course. If you look at the, at, at the scene of deforestation, deforestation is related to more risk of pandemic, uh, reduce biodiversity, and promote climate change. So a single human action is a connection between all the crises that we, have, we see today in the environment. And even in the case of climate change, we continue, I don't know here, but in Europe, we continue to think about this long-term process in terms of emergence, okay? We, every time we see a natural disaster, we see um, an extreme environment um, event, weather events, and so on, uh, floods, uh, droughts, we, we see this, and we are not able to understand what is happening in the process. In terms of evolution, I know that I could seem quite cynical, but anyway, in evolution, in evolution you have also a non-anthropocentric approach. If you apply a non-anthropocentric approach, what is happening today is that a mammal species coming out of Africa uh, 100 millennia ago was able to change the environment, okay, for our success, a wonderful success in terms of demographic diffusion, economic progress, progress of our knowledge, and so on. So I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. So it was a great success. Not for all, of course, because we have many inequalities. Anyway, that's another point. So a great success. We were able to exploit environments. If you look at the humans coming out of Africa since the beginning, in the Middle East and in Central Asia, Australia, in the Americas, you see exactly when Homo sapiens arrived, biodiversity declined. And you see new landscapes. So we are a species that change the world outside in order to adapt the world outside to us. Exactly the reverse with respect to the Darwinian process. In animals, animals adapt to the environment. And we adapt the environment to us. Okay, this was a trend that was very successful until a couple of generations ago. And then, as usual in evolution, we see a process that we call in evolution, evolutionary trap. That means, if you change the world in a too dramatic and too rapid way, what happens? That the next generation has to adapt to an environment that you, that we, change it too dramatically. So the adaptation of the next generation is more costly, is more expensive in terms of uh, possibility to adapt with respect to our generation. This is an evolutionary trap. So people arriving after us has to pay an environmental debt, an environmental cost. So that's exactly what is happening in the, in the climate change. So we will be able to adapt, we will survive, but the point is not our extinction. The point is at which cost we will be able to adapt to climate change. And what is very worrying, and science is writing this every week in every journal, the cost of the climate change will be paid by people that didn't contribute for nothing to climate change. So people living in uh, tropics and equatorial areas and people of the next generation. So two categories of people that didn't contribute to the climate change. And this is injustice. This is something absolutely wrong, not, not, not fair 
for us. So it's a great problem of justice. So I, lo I love, like Pope Francesco, when, when wrote in a, in a text that the, the climate just the injustice and the, injust in the social injustice are the same injustice. And it's, uh, it's one of the main moral dilemmas of our time and political also. So I'm going to open the, the, the floor for questions. And before going to, let me, let me know if someone wants to make a question. We have microphones over there. Um, I want to ask you about the moment when you published this book, Imperfection. So some of the reviews of people you know, in different places say that this is the perfect book for the moment, for times of uncertainty, for times where, you know, when we don't see clearly what's going on, and for times of change. And as we were talking yesterday, people will say or will declare that they love change, but it's actually most of the time they're talking about change that they can control, and this is uh, what we're living are times of change that we really, really can't control. So, do you feel that, that this is the perfect book for this moment? <laughs> it's an uh, unexpected result because I published before the pandemic, uh, a year before, and, and, and it was not related. But I have to say that my, it's not to, 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 to be, uh, to, in order to be honest, uh, I, I'm a friend of David Quammen, and I, I know very well his prediction. And in my conferences between 1916, uh, 17, 18, so before the pandemics, we used many times the example of viruses and bacteria evolving as an example of perfection against our imperfection. So we were so sad when the, the pandemic arrived in unpredictable way in terms of when and exactly uh, where, but it was absolutely predictable in terms of risk. That's another point that for me is important, is, and, and this book is related to this. So we, we use science, as Jacques Monod in the past said, a wonderful French uh, geneticist, we use science in an utilitarian way, and this is wrong. We think about science just when we, when we need it during an emergence, during a pandemic, climate change, and we ask scientists predictions. But science cannot do predictions. Can, they can tell you the degree of risk that you are running. And, and this is exactly what we, what we need, the idea of risk. So we are risking something. We, we cannot, it's not enough, it's not necessary to have exactly the prediction when something bad will happen. And this is irrational. This is another example of the, of, of the imperfection of our brain. Our brain doesn't like uh, prevention. So to do something costly today in order to re reduce the risk of something negative tomorrow. We don't like this. We like the present. We like to have an ethical uh, involvement with exactly a result today in the present, not in the future. We don't like this. This is another example of very worrying imperfection of our mind. We have to take into consideration this imperfection and to fight against this imperfection. So our lack of foresight, we are unable to do. In the United States, there is a wonderful way of thinking. Yes, in yesterday, my, my talk, I, I thought about it, the cathedral thinking. So think in terms of cathedral. OK, I, yesterday, I, I, I didn't say that it's very counterintuitive for us to be uh, cathedral thinkers because our mind is strictly related to present. But pandemics, climate change, environmental crisis, social environmental injustice are all cathedrals. So are uh, all processes in which we need two, three generations in order to solve them, hopefully. <laughs>